Well, Happy New Year, everybody. I think we're a week in, but it's still we can say that. So what I'm about to say, I don't think will be a surprise uh, to many of you, but what we see around us today, the truth is that when we look around in our culture and in our world, the truth is that we live in a time where people are increasingly offended by what others think, say, and do. In the past decade, uh, taking offense seems to have taken on a life of its own. We see sort of an increased sensitivity just about everywhere. And there are experts and writers and commentators who are giving us all kinds of reasons for that, all the way, all things from social media to, to political changes to cultural uh, changes. And so there's all kinds of commentary as to why that is, but most people recognize that it is so. It's something that really in the last eight years, I've been trying to wrap my head around uh, in ministry as I've seen it being played out in our culture, but also and especially as I see offense being played out in the lives of believers. In two, uh, 2020, really at the height of the, the pandemic, I, I came across an article that really helped me put into words what it was that I was trying to process with this cultural dynamic. And it was a, an article written by Abigail Dodds. She's a contributing writer to the Desiring God website. And so what, what she really said in this article really was, was helping me put into words what I was feeling. And what concerned me the most wasn't so much that we were seeing this change in our culture becoming more easily offended, but more than that, it was this spirit sort of affecting the church and how even as believers we were participating in it. <clears throat> Let me give you a couple of examples from my uh, ministry experience in the last uh, decade. In the last about seven or eight years, uh, I noticed that, that for the first time as a pastor, I started being asked by fellow believers how I was voting. That had never happened before. And it was from, from folks in the church, believers who, by the way, on both sides of the aisle, who were just almost panicked. Pastor, how, how did you vote? Who did you vote for uh, this election season? I just got to know. And I would ask the, the same question to each of them. What, why do you want to know? And it was this, almost this fear, this anger, this frustration driving them saying, well, I, I just can't believe that, that another believer might vote differently than I voted or they might be thinking differently about an issue that, that I've been thinking and I just saw this really infecting the church and having these conversations with fellow believers. The second thing that I noticed was, was having to deal with, with believers that were in groups who were at each other's throat because of differences of opinion. I saw a lot of this during the, the pandemic when uh, we were trying to grapple with, what, well, how do we do this? How do we respond to this thing that's happening? And, and in particular, certain policy types of things, masking, no masking. Th there were believers in groups together that were really at each other's throats because they disagreed on these issues. That, that troubled me. But you know what has troubled me more than anything in the last 10 years? It's it's talking with families and parents and grandparents and children and, and seeing this breakdown in the family dynamic where, where if a father or a mother or maybe a son or a daughter is holding a different opinion or a different view about something, not only do I disagree, but I'm not even sure I can be with you anymore. I'm not sure I want to have dinner with you. I'm not sure I even want to celebrate Christmas with you. And again, all of this from people within the church. So in this article, Abigail Dodd zeroed in really on something I think was happening. I love the title of the article, Blessed Are the Unoffendable. I love that. And, and in the article, here's, here's a bit of what she writes. She says that insecurity and fragility are underneath our proclivity to take up an offense, I think that's right. 
She says, and at root, our easily offended hearts are full of pride and idolatry. We've set ourselves as the standard of what is right and good and what must be honored. And any perceived challenge to that assumption results in anger, resentment, and the taking up of an offense. And I think she's absolutely right. As we begin this year, as we begin 2024, some serious people are writing and predicting things could get a little crazy in our country this year, right? Politically, socially, uh, economically. There's a lot of angst and anxiety from from people even I respect and I read, that they're fearful about what's coming this year. Maybe for, for even you personally, let's, let's back away from the big picture, but maybe even for you personally, maybe 2024 is, is starting out or shaping up to be maybe a crazy year for you just personally where you're at in relationships or in your own life. I, I, I don't know, but I can say I don't know what's gonna happen. I don't know what's uh, down the road. I don't know what's going to happen culturally, but, but I do know this, that, that God calls us as his people toward a different way of thinking and behaving. And so I would ask, maybe instead of contributing to this spirit of offense and outrage that we may see again this year, maybe the church, maybe as believers, we could offer up a different spirit. You see, I, I think we have the opportunity to exhibit a Christ-like spirit toward those who think and say and, and do things that we are even opposed to. I think that we have it within us in Christ to be able to respond in a different way. And, and so we've put sort of a, that spirit into words for this series with this phrase, being unoffendable. Well, let me start by just heading that off and saying, what, what does that even mean? right? Well, let me start by saying what I think it doesn't mean. What I think being unoffendable doesn't mean is that, that we're saying that there aren't offensive things in the world. That's not at all, at least what I'm saying. The truth is there are very offensive things in our world. We live in a broken world, and so we're going to experience offensive things, and, and that's just the truth of our reality, right? A second thing, We're not, I think, communicating that it's advisable to ignore or even pretend that we don't experience because of offensive things in our world, real frustration, anger, and even hurt. That's our reality. Another thing that I think it doesn't mean is that this idea that if we just become more mature spiritually that we can become immune to offense. I don't think that's true either. We, we live in a world and we live and we swim in offensive waters and, and we'll never quite become immune to that until one day we'll be in glory with the Father. So, so just a couple of things about really what I don't think this means. What, what does it mean then, this idea, this, this concept of being unoffendable? First of all, I think, what at least I'm trying to say is that maybe we could commit to take on the heart and the mind of Christ and bear the burden of offense. That's one thing that we see Jesus doing constantly in the Gospels is that there are many offensive things he encounters, but he seems to be able to bear the burden of that. Maybe in Christ, we ought to commit to do that together this year. A second thing, maybe we could commit to trusting God's sovereignty again. If we really believe in the sovereignty of God, that that he is in control, no matter how chaotic things might look or might become, if we really believe that truth, that he is on his throne, I think it gives us the ability to to take a step back and and to look at offensive things and to see them maybe in a different light and to say, you know what? yeah, I don't really like what, I, what it is that I'm seeing, but you know, I trust God and he's on his throne. There's, there's a peace to that. There's a stability of, 
that can come in our, even in our personality and our interactions with others because of that. Finally, I think what, what, what I mean at least by being unoffendable is also this hope that I have for each of us that as we move in that direction that we could experience the tangible blessings of what it really means to be more unoffendable, that peace, that hope, uh, improved relationships with others in our lives, greater intimacy, I believe, with God as well. So in this teaching series, we're going to look in the next few weeks of, of the life and the teaching of Jesus and his example for us. And, and of all people, Jesus had reason often to be offended. But he consistently set the example for what really an unoffendable spirit looks like. And that's not to say that he never exhibited any offense or, or had any righteous anger. I mean, turning over the tables at the, the temple is a good example. Jesus had the right, had uh, a righteous anger at times uh, to be offended and to respond. But, but that was almost exclusively reserved for the so-called religious leaders. What we see with Jesus in the Gospels is that he exhibits this, uh, this spirit even in the most offensive moment in his life on the cross. I love the way that Peter puts it in 2 Peter chapter 2 that where he says where, when he was reviled, he did not revile back. Right In his suffering, he did not threaten, but he did what? He continued to entrust himself to him who judges justly or rightly. I believe we can take on and should take on the same spirit. So today, we're in Mark chapter seven, and here Jesus is having this interaction with the Pharisees. The Pharisees is a group in a religious movement. They take, uh, take offense to an art form, really. They, they're often compelled to take offense. In fact, they see it as their job to look around and to say, who's not doing things the way that they ought to be done? And, and by that, they're gonna take offense. And in that offense, they exhibit sort of a self-righteous anger, an anger against any perceived slights against the law, against God, against their own power or authority. And Jesus, time and again at the gospel, hits at every one of those nerves. And so of all people, Jesus seemed to be most offensive to them. On this particular occasion, the Pharisees are offended because Jesus' disciples have not practiced the ceremonial washing. And, and <coughs> this is just one particular uh, tradition that they held to, but at every step in the Gospels, they're offended by what Jesus thinks, what he says, and what he does, or hear what he doesn't do. And so Jesus begins to address their faulty thinking about these uh, rituals, and he in introduces here a principle that I think can impact our own tendency to be easily offended by the thoughts and the words and the actions of others. And he makes this big idea really clear. In verse 15, he says, there's nothing outside going in that can defile a person. Let me put that in different language. It isn't about what's going on in, outside of me but it's about what is going on inside of me. And this was really difficult for the Hebrew mind to really wrap their arms around, as we'll see in just a moment. His own disciples were confused by this. It didn't register. But what Jesus is, is saying, the principle here is, listen, I know that you focus on these outwardly things, but, but if you're gonna know God, if you're gonna follow God, you've got to start inside in your own hearts. Now, Jesus is making a point about these ceremonial laws, but he's also addressing the Pharisees' practice and habit of being so easily offended and outraged. They felt righteous in their anger because, after all, in their way of thinking, they were offended on behalf of God. Does the church ever get that way? Do, do, do you and I ever get that way? Absolutely, we do. When we get offended, though, by what others think by what they say and by what they do. The truth is that we're often putting the focus in the wrong place. So Jesus calls us to think and to live differently. He wants us 
to live focusing from the inside out. And that doesn't mean that we ignore the world or we stick our heads in the sand when we see something offensive. That really is, is a, a spirit of avoidance. That's not what Jesus is addressing, but what he is talking about is perspective. Not avoidance, but perspective. And having this perspective, the inside out perspective, it really helps us, I think, turn the tables on the issue of being offended. It really, at the end of the day, it's really not what other people are saying or thinking or doing. It really isn't about those outside things. What has power to really damage me most is how I process, respond, and react to those things. And that is what flows out of the heart. I mean, the Bible says that, that what's in our hearts is eventually gonna flow outwardly. And it's going to have a lot to say about how we respond in, in, in our world and in the relationships that we have. And so what, what kind of spring is in your heart? What kind of things are in your heart? And that's where Jesus is trying to focus our attention. So I think a big challenge as we come in to this year where things might start getting a little crazy around us is that when we start to feel anger and frustration and we're offended, we need to turn inward and we need to ask God to deal with our own hearts. We need to ask him to help us see what's inside of us. What is it that needs to be cleaned, that needs to be adjusted, that needs renewal? So here's what I believe and, and really I think is an important theme for us tonight. When we allow Jesus to focus our attention on transformation in our own hearts, then here's what happens. The offensive thoughts, words, and actions of others, they begin to lose their power to offend us. I've never been a big uh, fan of superhero movies. I'm not a big fan of the Marvel movies that are out today, but when I was a kid, I did like the Superman movies. And for my generation, Superman will always be Christopher Reeve and Lex Luthor will always be Gene Hackman. So that version of Superman came out in 1978. And I remember I was fascinated by this movie. I mean, my favorite part <coughs> of the movie, if you might remember, is that Superman tracks Lex Luthor down to his under the city lair and he follows him down there because there's obviously there's a crisis that Luther has initiated. And so he goes, he goes down into his lair and there it's Lex Luthor tricks him. And he's, Superman's looking for the detonator to these rockets that are gonna destroy things. And he's looking for this detonator and he sees this iron box that Luther is sitting on. And if you recall, Superman can't, or excuse me, lead. He can't look through lead, right? And so he moves him out of the way and he's sure that that's where the detonator is, but Luther's tricked him and he opens that lead box and instead of the detonator being there, do you remember what was in there? It was a chain with kryptonite. And it was at that moment, of course, that Superman, you know, the kryptonite makes him weak and it can kill him. And as a kid, I remember being fascinated by that for a couple of reasons. Number one, I didn't realize until that point in the movie, I, I didn't read the comics or know much about Superman. I didn't realize that Superman could be hurt by anything. So that fascinated me. But the other thing that really made me curious was that it wasn't until the, the lead box was opened that Superman felt the effects of the crypto. Up to until then, he could have walked around, he could have danced on it, and it didn't seem like it was gonna affect him. But once he opened the box, right away, he felt the impact of that kryptonite. What I'm talking about tonight in this spirit of being unoffendable, what I'm talking about is not saying that we ought to take the world and we ought to take anything that's offensive to us and in some sort of super spiritual way, we ought to be able to stuff it in sort of this lead box and close the door and that way that we're not affected by it. There's, there's no such box that we can put offensive things in. We're going to be affected by offensive things, by, by the things that people think and believe and say and do. And there's no box that's gonna cover over that for us. So that's not what we're talking about. What, what I'm talking about is that taking on the spirit of Christ, we ought to be able with, in his power, 
to be able to see things rightly from the inside out, to have that perspective, to recognize those things are offensive to me, but they don't have to have power over me. There's no need for them to weaken me. No need for them to weaken my character or my relationships or the way that I interact with a lost and dying world. So this principle isn't trying to to stuff something in. It's trying to say, listen, the goal isn't to hide or ignore offensive things. The goal is that we yield to the authority and the power of Christ to endure those things. Okay, so what do we do? Well, we've got to begin by looking inward, doing that work. And and you know, the truth is that that's not very comforting because the truth is that what is inside of me is dark and ugly. That's why I don't like doing that work. That's why it's easier for me to be frustrated and angry and shocked by everything outside of me and the things I see in the world and to get my ire up about that. It's much easier for me to do that than to look inward because what's inside of me, and the truth is what's inside of each of you, in your heart there are some dark and ugly things. But that's the work Jesus calls us to do. So after he makes this inside, outside sort of point, he then, as he often did, he moves to a more intimate setting to further talk to the disciples, and he talks to them about some of these dark things that are in their hearts. It's not just about the Pharisees, it's also about them. And this talk didn't start out very well. His disciples are confused, and Jesus isn't real comforting to them. He's a little short with them. In verse 18, He says, are you also without understanding? In other words, literally what he says, are you just as dull-headed as those Pharisees? One of the things I love about Jesus, and it, it at times confuses me about him, is that he was often willing to be offensive, right? And I can point out to you, if you're not convinced of that, time and again in the Gospels where something Jesus says to his disciples or to others, it just it rubs them the wrong way. It doesn't come out right. It's not how I would say it. It may not be how you would say it. And here's something that he says to his own disciples that makes me laugh because he's an equal opportunity offender. (laughs) Jesus wasn't really all that concerned with creating safe spaces. So he calls his disciples dull-headed. He did that, by the way, on more than a few occasions. And so they have an opportunity at that point And I I like this. They had an opportunity to deal with something that maybe offended them in a moment from someone that they knew loved them. Maybe there's a lesson in that and how we exchange with one another and even how we raise our own children. So what he talks about here are some hard things, some dark and ugly things of the heart. And one of the things I think Jesus understood about this situation we all encounter of being offended in the world, here's an important thing. The times that we are offended are often some of the best opportunities for us to grow spiritually. You know, that's, that's been true in my life. So I tried to think as I was preparing for this message, I tried to go back in my life and, and to think, when was the, some of the times I was most offended? I wanna share one of those times with you. So many years ago, I had to ask a staff member uh, to resign. Now, I'm not going to go into the detail of all the reasons why, but there were some very unhealthy things in that person's life, and it was affecting their service. And so I met with this individual for a couple of months, and I just said, hey, I think this is where we're at. Now, (coughs) I offered this person a a kind of a part-time job. Why don't you stay in the church? Stay with those that you know and love, and let's work through this together, but this is really what needs to happen. Instead of sort of going in that direction, things took a really ugly turn. And on his way out, and as he resigned and left the church altogether, he began to insinuate to people here and there that I was perhaps having an inappropriate relationship with a female staff member. Boy, you talk about 
a stab in the heart. It was a dark and ugly thing. And I, it just, it was really difficult. Probably one of the most difficult things I've had to deal with, most offensive things I've had to deal with in a relationship and in a situation. Now, there wasn't anything to this. He actually, I think, knew that. The people that he communicated with, you know, as I talked to them, they knew that it wasn't true. And what I learned is that that old axiom that hurt people often go and hurt other people was playing out. But for months, I, I didn't know how to process this. I, it took me aback. I'm not somebody I tend to on that scale. I don't really see myself. Maybe I am at times. But often I don't see myself as being easily offended. But I was truly offended. I was not just offended, but that offense led to just anger. And so I was talking to another leader within the church about this situation. And I was bringing it up again. And he just looked at me, this particular person's a counselor, a trained counselor. And he said, you know, Joe, he said, can I ask you a question? I said, yeah, absolutely. He said, why are you still holding on to this? And I was like, well, what do you mean? How could I not? I mean, look at what, what has been said here. What, what, you know, somebody trying to make, cause a lot of damage on their way out, not just for me, but for the church. And I said, this it's just a terrible thing. See, yeah, 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 I get, get all of that, but we didn't believe it. Why are you still holding on to it? And, you know, in that moment, I had to really take a step back and, and ask myself some, some questions. Yeah, why am I still holding on to this? Why am I holding on to that anger? Why am I holding on to that offense? And what I realized in a process of a few weeks uh, praying through this and asking God what's really going on, what I realized that in my own heart, there were some dark and ugly things. And in particular, pride. I take pride in my, my wife, in my marriage, in my family. And I think that's, that's a good thing, but on the other end of that, there was something ugly about it that was not allowing me to be Christ-like. And ultimately, what, what got over to me was the Lord was saying, I want you not only to pray for this person, but I want you to pray the best for this person. And when the Lord asked me to do that, I took a step back and I, I thought, I don't know that I can pray that. And it revealed an ugliness and a darkness in my heart that took me by surprise. And it humbled me. It still humbles me to this day. When we're offended, <clears throat> the truth is that we can have good reason for that. We can have, uh, you know, sort of our, our, our understanding of why we're offended and that it was a wrong thing. But the truth is that within all of us, as Dodds wrote in her article, there is a, a pride and idolatry that can lead us to some dark places. Jesus didn't want his disciples to get caught in that same cycle of offense that the Pharisees seemed to always be trapped in. And so he's calling them to get over themselves. He's calling them to dig deeper, to open their eyes to the dark, ugly things within them. In verse 21, here's, here's the kind of things he talks about. He says, for from within, out of the heart of man come evil thoughts sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. This is a pretty nasty list, right? But it's actually an honest accounting of the hearts of men. Jeremiah 17 tells us that the heart is deceitful, above all things, and it is desperately sick. There is a pride and an idolatry in every one of our hearts. And, and the reason that I think this is important is because even this dark list, it brings up the, this truth that when we react in relationship, when we react to the world, that there's gonna be offensive things. The truth is there are dark things we've gotta deal with in our own hearts in order to have the spirit of Christ and respond in a Christ-like manner. So really, this list is a good exercise for us in what it means to be, be more unoffendable. We could take this list, we could get away from the noise, and we could just deal with God about our own hearts, and we could pray through. There are 12 different types of sins that Jesus mentions here. We could ask 
God, Lord, is there any impure thing within me among these 12 things or the many branches off the trees of these 12 sorts of things? And that kind of evaluation is an exercise I would encourage all of us to do to start the year. I think it can help us in three ways with taking offense this year. First of all, it can help us replace our own sensitivity with a self-awareness. Now, don't get me wrong. Being self-aware isn't about wallowing in our sin, lashing ourselves over the back. But listen, the darkness of my own sin does something when I'm willing to look at it. It shines a light on the greatness of our Lord and Savior. The darkness of my own sin helps me recognize the forgiveness and acceptance of Jesus Christ. And in that recognition, there is renewed joy and a renewed thankfulness for what Christ has forgiven me. Boy, that's so critical. Why do, why do you think the scripture calls us to confess our sins every day regularly? It's not to wallow in them. It's just to, to recognize and be renewed again in the greatness of Jesus and his forgiveness and his acceptance of us. I don't have to live. You don't have to live constantly offended in an offensive world because we can focus on Jesus and thank him for who he is and what he has accomplished in our lives. Second, I think this exercise could help us to stop trying to protect our own self-righteousness and instead continue to pursue holiness. Often when we get offended by what others think, say, and do, it's because it violates our own sense of self-righteousness. That's what happened with the, the Pharisees time and again, right? But when we rightly know our own hearts, we see that that kind of righteousness it's just a, a house of cards. The Pharisees refused to see that. They refused to accept the truth of what was in their own hearts. They had the opportunity. They could have turned to God, but they refused to do that. And so what, what, what I think we need to understand is that being unoffendable means leaving behind that sense of self-righteousness. Are you willing to do that this year? And then finally, I think this exercise could help us to investigate the true level of animosity and motivation behind our feelings of offense. When we're offended, we're gonna experience animosity, but we often don't really fully appreciate everything that is driving that. Even this list, it highlights how complicated the human heart really is, how many different motivations are behind how we respond to others. And so we've gotta ask, the hard questions of ourselves. What's really behind my anger? What's really behind my frustration and my taking offense? Look, look at this list. Most of the words in the list are very interesting. They're very specific. Evil thoughts, right? Specific plans, scheming. Envy is an interesting word. It, it literally translated means an evil eye. I've got an evil eye on someone or something. Wickedness, it really is better translated here as malice, the desire to inflict evil on someone else. We're complicated beings, right? But then look at the last word in this list, foolishness. At first glance, it doesn't seem to fit. It, it's a word that describes someone who is desensitized morally and spiritually. It describes someone who acts <clears throat> carelessly not out of necessarily specific intention or thoughts, but more out of just a careless approach to life. Now, what does that have to do with being offended? Well, when we start asking God what's really behind our feelings of offense, I think sometimes there are some very specific things going on in our own hearts that are pouring gas on the fire, and we need to deal with those sins. But here's what I suspect. Most of the time, and, and for most of us, our struggle with being offended, I think actually is often associated with just a general carelessness. We become disconnected, even desensitized to the Spirit of God and His way of thinking, His perspective. And it's easy then to see something in our culture, in our world, and just become angry and outraged 
and defended. And you know, really the first step is to do that work of the heart, not just to confess the complicated things going on in our own life, but to confess that we need again the heart of God. It's a new year. When we are offended, and I fully anticipate some offensive things happening this year in our culture, I think we need to see it as an opportunity to be the people of God, to have the spirit and the mind of Christ. And by the way, it leads, I think, to the best evangelical attitude we can have in our culture, and that is not to be easily offended, but to have our heart open to everyone, no matter where they're at or what it is they say or think or do, so that we can point them in a loving way, in a caring way, toward Jesus Christ. Would you be willing to join me in that challenge this year?